Hi everyone, my name is Nick. I'm on the Nexus team. Today I want to talk to you a little bit about tracing uh, the various layers of Android. In particular, uh, I want to show you how to analyze a trace that captures information both from the application level, um, various parts of the framework, um, and the kernel, and having that all be in one trace. So this is an overview of what I kind of want to talk about, is compare tracing and sampling when you talk about profiling, um, show you how to capture a trace and how to analyze it, um, how we trace or instrument Java, C++, and kernel code, which is all C. Uh, and then I'll show you a quick anecdote from one bug that we were taking a look at in Perf Triage. So to start with, two kind of quotes that I think are really inspirational for doing kind of tracing stuff. Um, the first one is kind of a reminder that everything happens for a reason. Uh, I'm sure you've all seen bugs where you go, how could this possibly ever happen? There's no way that this could happen, right? Um, we, we've seen things all the way down to like memory corruptions due to like DDR uh, failures and like random bit flips and memory corruption and like even those have explanations. So uh, like tracing I, I think really helps give you um, a better view into your code and especially the second quote here um, is more along the lines of whenever you have a very complex system, there's a lot of moving parts and a lot of moving pieces. And simply, uh, there can si sometimes simply be too much source code for you to analyze and to read, right? Someone might say, oh, just view the source. That's the ultimate source of truth. And while that's correct, when there's so much source code, you don't know where to start. It's difficult to see how the pieces fit together. And in my opinion, it's easier to do a trace and understand what code is actually live code that's running uh, and what runs for longer durations than, than other code. Um, it helps you kind of pinpoint what's important and kind of spot uh, when you're doing things that are maybe redundant or could be optimized or could use a better algorithm. So when we talk about profiling, this is a, a form of debugging um, tailored towards finding performance related issues uh, there's kind of two categories, um, one's sampling and one's tracing. So sampling is usually a good place to start. Um, sampling usually is, is fairly automated. It just has to do with sampling call stacks and unwinding those call stacks. Uh, that's fairly low overhead relative to tracing. Um, and that's usually a good starting point. So today's talk is definitely putting the cart before the horse because I'm going to focus on tracing, which is the which is usually what you want to do to follow up is once you've identified something in a sample that's taking a long time, uh, tracing is usually more manual as you have to go in and instrument your code um, before you can kind of start to analyze the data. So tracing tends to be higher overhead than sampling. Uh, I guess everything's relative. Um, so usually you don't want to trace um, multiple items at once and we'll see in a little bit how we kind of filter those results. Um, but usually you want to start with sampling and uh, Yabin and I are actually working on cool stuff for sampling. So maybe in a follow-up talk, we'll show some cool uh, sampling stuff for the frameworks. Um, but today we're going to take a look at various sampling utilities, in particular SysTrace. So the first thing that we want to acquaint ourselves with is this notion of trace tags. So because tracing adds overhead to what we're doing, um, we don't want to analyze multiple things that we don't need to. So in Android, we have a, this notion called trace tags, which is a way of kind of specifying, I just want to analyze the graphics stack. Show me what's going on in graphics. Or I just want to analyze binder. Show me what's going on in binder. Or networking. Or there's a couple various trace tags. Um, so there's a, a list. Um, on this on this link on the slides here, you can see uh, what the what the full list of trace tags are. I think if you invoke SysTrace, it will also print out what some of the the tags are, um, and it's possible to add your own tags as well. Um, but usually, you can get away with using either the existing ones that we have so far, or using something that's called app level tracing that we'll see in a little bit. So here's how you invoke. SysTrace. So assuming that your current working directory is the top of an Android source checkout, um, within external Chromium Trace, 
there's a, a Python utility called SysTrace. Uh, you give it a list of different tags that you want it to um, activate, in a sense. So the, all of these tags that you enable, all the instrumentation is going to be active in the captured trace that you'll see. So for instance, here I'm saying any binder-related tag, I want to instrument all the binder calls. Uh, binder is how we do IPC and RPC across processes in Android. I want to instrument graphics. I want to have information about the scheduler. I want to see what was running on which core of the CPU when. Uh, dash A is used for application level tracing. So system UI uh, is all written in, in Java. Um, it has tags that are not specific to binder, graphics, or scheduler. So you can say, turn on the, the generic app level tracing ones. And then finally, I want to output the file as uh, an HTML file. So this HTML file has everything that you need in it. Uh, you can either go to Chrome slash tracing and click load and pull in the file or simply open it itself and it has everything. Uh, the, the framework that's used for drawing this resulting chart is the style of the chart is called a flame graph, um, which we'll get to in a little bit. Uh, but this utility is actually open source. It's on GitHub. It's called Catapult. So if you ever want to hack on it or read the source code, figure out how it works, uh, it's all on GitHub. Uh, can anyone, does anyone here recognize this gentleman? Show of hands. Can anyone, does anyone want to try and summarize what Amdel's law is? All right, so uh, Amdel's law focuses mostly, is referring to speed up, um, but kind of the, the key takeaway from it is uh, if you're going to invest your time on making something faster, you first want to measure and figure out where you're spending most of your time. So in this really good example that I like taken shamelessly from Wikimedia, uh, if you have two processes, an A and a B, and you spend a, an awful lot of time and you make B five times faster, uh, the 5x looks great compared to maybe a 2x performance improvement you could have gotten in the same amount of time optimizing A. Uh, so while that number looks better on paper, the overall measurement actually doesn't change uh, as drastically compared to if you had focused on uh, which process takes the most amount of time, right? So kind of the idea behind sampling and then tracing is this notion of measurement. So we want to be able to measure and figure out where are we spending our time, right? When we talk about um, optimization, we want to be focusing our optimization efforts uh, where we've measured that things are taking longer than others. So the flame graph that we saw, um, kind of a zoomed out photo, but we'll see some more uh, in SysTrace, um, is an interesting graph that makes it really easy, in my opinion, to understand uh, call stacks. So um, the ones you'll see in SysTrace are inverted from this one here. But essentially, you have a, a, the uh, first stack frame in the function is function A. A calls B when B is done. The next statement is invoke H, right? We can see B calls C, which calls D, which calls E and F, and F calls G. So when you have a flame graph, um, you might be tempted to, to look at a function like A, because A is the biggest, right? We were just, our previous uh, diagram we just showed, showed that we were looking for whatever was taking the longest amount of time, right? Well, it turns out for a flame graph, we're actually interested in the outermost edge, the topmost edge. Um, and essentially, who has the largest profile uh, as far as the edge is concerned? So actually, the function that we would be most interested in looking at in this example is actually function G. And so I've tried to highlight here in pink uh, what I look for is kind of that the, the length of the, the outermost edge. So let's say you have some Java that code that you want to uh, trace. So um, what you'll do is you'll import Android OS trace, and then you can either use trace begin and trace end, and you give it the, the tag that you want, um, the tag that you want to uh, have to invoke through SysTrace, uh, and then you give it a string literal. Um, you can give this string literal whatever you want. Uh, my preferred way is to 
um, simply put the class in a hash uh, hash um, and symbol and then uh, the method name. So this makes it easier for someone to then, if they see your trace in a trace that they captured, it makes it easier for them to go grep back in the code base and know exactly what was going on here. Versus if you put some string that means something to you today and you leave that trace in the code base, it's probably not going to mean anything to the next person who reads it unless it's very meaningful. Um, you can also use trace begin section and end section for app level tracing when you don't really care about a particular trace tag. Um, so maybe you, you might have some kind of trace that's important to you as maybe the system UI developer, but it's not really important to the graphics team or to Binder or whichever. Maybe you'd prefer begin section and end section to trace begin and, uh, trace, begin and trace end. Now there's also um, additional methods for checking whether or not a trace tag is enabled. So let's say the string that you wanted to print for some reason is very expensive to compute. Uh, at runtime, you can check and see as well, is a trace tag enabled? And if so, generate this expensive string and then call trace begin. So that's an option you can do as well. For C++, um, there's two, two different functions. There's two different header libraries. One's an NDK and one's not. Uh, I forget which. I think the first is an NDK and the second is not. But um, you want to include cutils trace.h, uh, and then you call trace begin, uh, a trace begin uh, in capital, or there's also uh, the lowercase version. So I'm not sure. I don't remember off the top of my head what the difference is between these two. But because we're dealing with C++ and we have the preprocessor, um, we can use double underscore func double underscore, which the preprocessor will replace with the, the function name. Uh, this could just as well be a string literal. Um, I like in utils this trace.h because there's a trace.call is essentially an RAII wrapper around the same trace begin with double underscore func. So anytime you enter a scope, you can just uh, invoke this macro. Uh, and it basically does the heavy lifting for you, and you don't have to close out or watch multiple return statements. But we'll get to that in a, in a little bit later. Um, and finally, in the kernel, uh, so this is a, a little hacky, and I hope there's a better way to do this. Um, but what I've done is I, I published a gist here that kind of shows uh, essentially getting a kernel trace to show up uh, in SysTrace is a lot more work. Maybe this is something that, that we can improve in um, I don't know, in the future. But essentially what, what I do is reuse the kernel has a uh, functionality called trace events. And so in order to get trace information, you need to create a new trace event. So this is a patch. Uh, I've taken a look at frame buffer code on Marlin Sailfish. Um, so there was no existing uh, trace event for the frame buffer. So I created one. Uh, so there's actually... There's an LWN article that talks about trace trace events. Um, essentially, a lot of boilerplate here, um, but essentially, you kind of have to define via macros that are really not fun to debug when they don't work. Um, a fast copy method for any kind of struct that you're debugging, um, and then when you pull this in, you can uh, you would invoke your your trace event. Um, so this is something that, that you can add throughout the rest of the kernel code. Um, you kind of pull in this header, and you have a define. And then I define two macros here that you don't really need to define. Um, but we basically need to log the current thread ID. Uh, and name is actually just a string here, and whether or not we want to actually enable the trace or disable the trace. So on trace entry and trace exit, essentially. Um, now. Once you have this in the kernel, uh, the kernel has a whole su um, subsystem for dynamically enable, dynamically enabling tracing and disabling tracing. So on an Android device, you need to, once you have patched your kernel uh, like this, you need to recompile your kernel and reflash it on device. Uh, and then you need to enable tracing of that subsystem. So you, through SysFS, you just um, essentially uh, enable it. And then finally, when we capture the trace, um, if you actually take a look at the HTML file that's generated by SysTrace, 
It actually will have tons of kernel tracing information as well, uh, but Catapult is not uh, set up to graph that information because it's assuming that um, you're using a trace or application level trace and not any of the kernel tracing information. So uh, a quick hacky thing is just to run the output uh, of the SysTrace HTML through sed and do a replace of the tag of the trace event that you just defined uh, with this tracing mark right, which is what a trace will label traces as. Um, so it's definitely a lot more work to get kernel tracing into um, to show up in a SysTrace. Uh, definitely worthwhile. Uh, I'll show you in a little bit um, how we can kind of tell um, these calls apart. Kernel subsystem already has a trace event. So the first step is, is essentially to figure out does this kernel subsystem have its own trace event, um, which kind of defines this fast copy of whatever internal structure. Um, and if it is, like things are relatively easy, right? Because then you just need to invoke uh, your, your trace tag. Uh, one of the most important things about tracing is to clean up properly after yourself, right? So um, one of the issues when you instrument uh, blocks of code is you have to be wary of the, con of, uh, of the control flow of any block of code. So if, if you think of the programming style of either having multiple return statements or one return statement, if you have a function of code that you want to instrument and there's one return statement, like that's really easy to do, right? Like there's, there's one, should be obvious where entry to that function is. You can add your trace begin as the first statement and then trace end as the, the last. Um, but there's some caveats depending on which language you're tracing, right? So Java, um, trace begin can go outside of a try finally block, but your trace end call you should be put in a finally block. Um, and th this is because Java has exceptions, right? And so um, even though, uh, not, not only do you have to say trace end before every return statement, um, but you need to wrap uh, all statements in this try finally block because if any of those statements throws an exception, uh, you could return execution from there. And if you, if you miss a trace end due to an exception, you'll just see like a really long uh, trace as if like it started and then it never stopped. And it turns out an exception was thrown in there. Uh, C++ makes it super easy because it has RAII. Um, that's essentially, uh, for, for those of you who don't write a lot of C++, um, it's essentially having destructor functions where the compiler will add a uh, call to the destructor implicitly on every possible um, uh, exit of scope of an automatically allocated variable or uh, dynamically allocated ones too. But um, C uh, is, is fairly straightforward. You just look for multiple return statements. Uh, the only thing that's not good is uh, there can be a lot of uh, macro magic, especially in kernel code. Uh, you need to watch out for any code that makes use of go to and set jump long jump. Uh, I haven't really seen too many issues with set set jump long jump being used, um, but that's just one thing to watch out for as well. Um, so now I want to show you some traces what I took at took a look at. So not a super exciting bug, um, but kind of breaking down what we're looking at when we look at a sys trace. So. Um, here's a SysTrace that I captured. Um, I think the bug was we were seeing really slow screen on times with uh, Marlin Sailfish. So you touch a fingerprint sensor and device takes um, anywhere from half a second to six seconds in this case to unblock the screen, right? So uh, on the top here, we can see uh, some existing trace information saying that the screen on was blocked and it's possible to measure the duration of these things. And so here you can see it took six seconds in this trace that was captured. And I think one of the things that I added was, um, I said I wanted to trace binder transactions and graphics and a whole bunch of tags I had sprinkled on here. Um, and uh, working with Phil on the perf team, um, Phil's kind of pointing me in the right direction to get started with um, kind of saying, hey, there's this wake lock here. So, Wake locks are used throughout Android to keep the device from powering off. 
um, when you're doing some kind of critical operation. Uh, and so we can see a wake lock gets taken here in this light blue very early on and released. Um, and that's kind of a starting point. So when you want to start tracing code and you have lots of code in a really complex system and you don't know where to start, um, getting started can be one of the hardest things of figuring out what you want to trace, right? So that's usually why you want to start with sampling before you move into tracing. That way you kind of get a heads up for what's going on and what's taking long. Um, so given a sample, then it gets easier to start. Otherwise, you're kind of playing guessing games, trying to figure out what part of the system should I be starting with first. And then a lot of instrumenting and tracing is uh, when you find something that looks interesting and you instrument it um, and you want to learn more about what's going on, uh, you typically run through another debug, compile, trace loop again and again and again where you sprinkle additional instrumentation, uh, your a trace begin, uh, trace end calls on either parent functions or child functions, depending on if you want to find out, okay, who's calling me or what am I calling? Where am I spending my time? Right? So the first thing that I thought uh, when looking at this trace is, oh my God, there's a lot of stuff going on here. What, what, um, it's definitely overwhelming. It definitely presents a lot of information. Um, but okay, system UI, that sounds somewhat related, right, to, to the screen unlock process. And we can see some binder transactions that are taking up a, a large duration of time, right? So what's kind of unfortunate here is we don't have too much information about uh, who, uh, which method triggered a binder uh, RPC call. Um, there, there actually is UI for, uh, that will draw arrows for binder transactions um, between processes. One of the issues is you can only turn it uh, all on or all off. And if you turn it on, uh, it essentially looks like a big ink smear uh, because there's so many binder transactions going on at any given moment uh, that, that the, the, the trail of lines becomes very difficult to follow. So after doing some more digging, I found some, um, some key guard code, right? So uh, again, I didn't write any of this stuff. Don't really know how it works, how it fits together. Um, so we go in and just sprinkle a ton of instrumentation on everything and figure out how it works. Um, so we can see this, this wake lock that we were interested in before. We zoom in a little bit more. Um, we can actually see, so I'd instrumented the fingerprint unlock controller trying to figure out, oh, maybe the issue is something to do with the fingerprint sensor. Um, so we can see here that the fingerprint unlock controller uh, it differentiates between when a fingerprint is acquired, uh, which it refers to as detecting a touch, and when the fingerprint is authenticated. So um, there, it takes a little bit of time for the fingerprint to iterate through all of the fingerprints that you've added to its database and try and match uh, what was read from the sensor to a valid fingerprint to authenticate it. Um, and then later on, the phone status bar will invoke a method called hide key guard. So turns out there's a whole key guard class that's um, related to the, the lock screen uh, on the device. So when you wake up the device by pressing the power button or touching the fingerprint sensor, um, you'll, you'll see kind of the, the key guard appears, which will prompt you for a password if, if one's set. So this kind of starts to give us a clearer picture, but you can see here there's still this very large binder transaction, which I couldn't catch. So things get very complicated. Um, it, it's very easy for you for any given method to grep who, what are all my call sites. Um, so you can kind of instrument and see who called me, who called me, who called me to go kind of go up the call stack. Or it's very easy to then go to the, all the statements within that function, all the child functions and instrument them. See who did I call, who did I call, who did I call. Um, but essentially you can only go so far up until um, certain processes have multiple threads and it, um, you kind of get stopped when you get to uh, thread invocation or thread creation. Um, so the, the scheduler actually kind of hides uh, a lot of things. So this is a binder transaction. I actually, never actually found out uh, what this binder transaction is, right? Um, which is unfortunate. I could do some more digging. Um, but taking a look and instrumenting some more code. So now this is instrumenting some C++ code. Um, so I was taking a look at system server. Um, so system server is, um, we make use of a, a monolithic kernel in Android, but then a lot of the system services with Android have a very 
microkernel-esque feel to them, uh, where we have multiple servers and then lots of apps are communicating to these servers via um, via binder, RPC calls. So there's a class called Photonic Modulator. It happens to be a thread of system server. System server spawns multiple threads for all these different servers. Um, and we can see here that almost for the whole duration of screen unblocked, uh, we see something that's requesting display state and it's trying to set some display power mode and it triggers a binder transaction. So without turning on all of the binder transactions, if you click on a given bar at the bottom, you'll get a listing of incoming and outgoing edges for binder transactions. And if you click on one, you'll get a highlight of an arrow. So that's, that's what this red line is here, is basically saying uh, we invoked uh, a binder RPC call. So you'll see binder transactions either be, usually be either the bottom edge or the top edge. And that depends if they're the, um, the client or the server or the, the requester or the, uh, the server, I guess. Um, so here we're making a call that triggers a binder transaction and then someone else will service the binder transaction and they'll show up as the, the, the top bar, right? So following where it goes, um, we get a binder reply here in Surface Flinger. Okay, so I need to either enable trace tags for Surface Flinger or analyze Surface Flinger or instrument Surface Flinger. Um, and we can see here, uh, I, I believe that this is, this view is multiple threads of the same process. So I think, uh, I, I don't have definitive proof, but I believe that these two threads are synchronized um, in sur Surface Flinger. And one of the things that, that caught my eye here looking at this, um, it's very difficult to, to kind of see this, um, even when looking at, at a SysTrace, like blown up big. But if you can see this hardware device power on call, uh, which is um, C++ code and Service Flinger trying to turn on the screen. Um, there's this top edge of it is colored, and you get that when you add sketch to the command line when you invoke SysTrace, um, and that shows you what the thread state is, right? So um, pthreads has a state machine. You can go look it up. Um, red means the thread is put to sleep, uh, uninterrupt uninterruptible sleep. Usually it's doing some kind of IO or communicating with someone else or blocking uh, within the kernel, for instance. Um, but then the rest of the leading edge is green. And actually percentage wise, uh, sorry, green means that it's running. It's doing busy work. Could be spinning in a spin lock, who knows, right? So if, if we just take a look at percentage wise, it's 88% is spent in this running category and 12% is spent uh, in a sleep state. So. That's kind of going back to that Amdahl's law example. Uh, let's try and figure out like what busy work we're doing here for 88% of our time that's blocking screen on. So this is with, um, after adding um, the kernel tracing to get more information, suddenly now we have um, more information about what's going on in the kernel. So uh, it starts off in Surface Flinger, we see C++ code with this hardware device power on call, um, but eventually it invokes an IOCTL, which is kind of a, a messy sys call that's like a catch-all um, that a lot of drivers unfortunately implement. Um, so you can see here that we're invoking some kind of IOCTL related to the frame buffer, um, that the type of it is a FBIO blank. So we're asking the screen to blank is terminology for either um, to, to unblank the screen is essentially to turn the screen on versus blank the screen is to turn the screen off. Um, and then there's multiple calls within the kernel here, um, which, so a lot of this code looks relevant, like it's doing actual work that we expect, but then we get this, we find out that all the busy work we're doing is spent entirely in one function, which is this console un unlock function. Um, and uh, whenever you add sked, uh, to collect scheduler information in a trace. Uh, you'll get this at the very top of your SysTrace, this area. So this shows you for the four cores on Marlin Sailfish, uh, what was running at any given time that, that we had instrumented. So here we can see Surface Flinger is actually running full bore on one core, essentially saturating one core. Um, and that you can see kind of the width of this maroon line of when it was scheduled lines up pretty well with this screen duration, right? So we can see hardware device power on, 
was saturating a whole core. 88% of its time was spent within the kernel in a function called console unlock. Um, once we spotted this, this was essentially a known issue. Uh, has to do with um, having serial debugging enabled on your kernel. So whenever we're debugging kernel code, uh, you may not have ADB working. So we actually use the headphone jack as a serial console. And usually I use screen or something to connect to the device. Um, and because I had this debug feature on, which is something that we can toggle on and off, um, essentially the kernel ring buffer was getting, um, wasn't printing out until this IOCTL finished. And then as content got buff buffered and buffered and buffered, it would actually take longer and longer and longer to write over the serial console at its really slow baud rate um, to kind of um, DQ all the messages that came into this buffer. So we're actually seeing, uh, if you had a device that was overloaded where it was doing a lot of work and all the other cores were saturated, um, it was possible that um, a lot of different applications could be adding a lot more to the council's, uh, to the kernel's uh, ring buffer, it's uh, D message output, um, which would make council unlock take longer and longer and longer and longer. So known issue, real simple fix, uh, disabling um, serial debugging when you don't need it, uh, speeds up unlocking the screen quite a bit, right? So this is what a healthy trace looks like after it's been fixed, right? So before we can see how hardware device powering on, you can see the time measurement up here I took. It takes, in this one, it took uh, half a second. So the trace earlier I showed you six seconds was from different points in time. Um, 50, taking half, uh, 500 milliseconds to unlock the screen was still way above expected. Um, we were expecting something close to like 100 to 200 milliseconds. Uh, so a healthy trace here, we can see now screen unblock takes 130 milliseconds, which is much better. And hardware device power on is now spending its entire entirety in the IOCTL call as expected and no time in council unlock. So if we wanted to, we can go and try and calculate the speed up here, right? Think of Amdahl's law again. Um, and if we really wanted to improve this number again, then we could go and maybe spend some time in this flush kickoff and try and figure out what's it, what is it doing here on this exposed leading edge or maybe DSI panel on but I think we're kind of at a state now where we're, we're good enough and we're happy. So, so I'll give you a quick trace, uh, a, a quick run through of um, how I kind of work with, with SysTrace. So once you have a trace open, uh, I really like the, the controls. So you scroll, scrolling vertical, um, and then it's got this uh, WASD for zooming in and out. So W zooms in and S zooms out and then uh, A and D for panning left and right. Um, so usually what I'll go through and do is uh, collapse a bunch of processes I don't care about. So if there's any kind of application running like wallpapers, GMS core, I don't care what it's doing. Um, I don't think it's in the critical unlock path, so I'll just collapse those. Uh, let's say I want to, I just added some instrumentation to key guard. Uh, you hit slash to jump into the search box. So typing key guard, uh, you'll see all the um, all the color fade out of uh, all the bars, assuming your search has a valid match. Um, so let's say, for instance, I typed a bunch of stuff that doesn't match anything, uh, all the color comes back. So that's really helpful when you're trying to find your, your instrumentation. Uh, you can see there's a little bit of light coloring here for everything that matches key guard so far. Uh, if I hit enter, it will go to the first result. And if I keep hitting enter, it will jump to the next result. So you might be able to see the colored bars getting lit up. And so then you can dive in and, and find more information. Uh, to If you hit, it, let's say um, you have a big uh, trace, a lot of information, and you want to find where's your new, um, where's the latest instrument that you just added. You can do a search, things stay gray. That shows me that my, my um, instrumentation did show up in this, key, in this trace somewhere. I hit enter to find the, maybe the one I'm interested in. Um, then I'll hit escape to get out of the search box and I'll hit M to mark it. So this is what gives us the time. You can see up top that it now shows us 
17 milliseconds for whatever I searched for. Um, and then you can hit F to zoom in on that item. And then you'll have to scroll and find, uh, here it is, right? So, um, and then hit, you can hit slash again, hit enter and go to the next one, hit escape, mark it, fill it. Um, so that, that's um, how I work with SysTrace. And so my call to action to everyone is if you have uh, code that you th that is um, performance critical, please help out your fellow um, folks interested in perf and instrument uh, any code uh, that, that you think is worthwhile. Um, anything that, that could be a problem down the line if it ever slows down more than expected. Um, the thing that I, I really like to see that I tend to do a lot is instrument both sides of a binder call. So I think um, binder is really neat, but it can be difficult to debug uh, who is invoking binder and who is on the receiving end of a binder call. So uh, if you're making use of anything that invokes binder that could potentially take a long time, like please wrap that in some instrumentation so it shows up in a trace. Um, and it makes it a lot easier to, to prove that you've improved something if, if you can measure it. So um, thanks everyone for your time. I appreciate it.